Coming up, when a punk rock band recorded a disco song, they alienated their punk followers who accused them of selling out. On the flip side, the disco faithful, they treated them like outsiders who were merely pandering for commercial success. Here's the thing though, it's one of the coolest songs of its time. In the middle of this identity crisis, the same disco song surprisingly became a huge international hit and it catapulted the band to superstardom. And the iconic title of the song, that came from the band trying to figure out how to replace a lyric that was a swear word for fear of getting censored on the radio. You're not gonna believe this story, it's so funny and so cool. Coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember the good old days of getting a Happy Meal at McDonald's when you were a kid, just for the toy, you're gonna dig this channel of musical nostalgia. Make sure that you subscribe below right now so you never miss out on any of our, our interviews. You know, click the bell and all that good stuff. I know you'll dig this channel. Make sure to check us out on Patreon for even more content as well. Full interviews, new stuff there. Also our merch, all this helps us keep the music alive. That's what it's about. The sextet named Blondie broke out of the punk rock scene in New York City's East Village. I mean, what a band. You had Jimmy Destry on electronic keyboards, Frank and Fonte on lead guitar, Chris Stein on rhythm guitar, also 12 string and Ebo. There was also Nigel Harrison on the bass and the wonderful Clem Burke on drums. Oh, and of course, the legendary Deborah Harry on lead vocals. The band was labeled a punk band, but their attitude it was more rebellious than the nature of their music. To be defiant and uncool, they would perform a disco song in their set, sometimes a song they had recorded on a demo titled The Disco Song. When they played the disco song at their club gigs, like the legendary CBGB, uh, drummer Clem Burke recalled there were handcuffed boos from the crowd. Now, the original version of the disco song, that was conceived between 1974 and 1975, then re-recorded in 78 for their multi-platinum album Parallel Lines, classic album. The title was changed from I Once Had a Love to Heart of Glass. Guitarist Chris Stein and singer Deborah Harry they were partners romantically and professionally at this time. As a driving force behind Blondie, the couple conspired on virtually all of the band's music, Debbie writing the lyrics and Chris inventing the music. Debbie sat down to come up with a song about a lost love and the emotional fragility that is the fallout. Uh, Debbie drew from personal emotional experience to craft the song that was eventually recorded as Heart of Glass. She wanted to, to capture a feeling of having a love that was once powerful, and beautiful, but soon discovering that the relationship was not as lasting as you know, it may have seemed. The song expresses a sense of disillusionment and the fear of being hurt by the inevitability of fall in love. She began the song by borrowing a remark she overheard from the mouth of a New York City cab driver that stuck with her. I could totally picture Debbie Harry in a cab with the cab driver saying, you know, I once had a love and it was a gas. Uh, the euphoria of Debbie's narrative quickly shifted to frustration in her very next line after that, though. Soon turned out to be a pain in the ass. I tell you what, we'll come back to that three-letter word because it was almost as controversial as a four-letter word. When Blondie initially structured I Once Had a Love for a demo, it was a slower reggae season ballad, but the band, they weren't feeling it. You know, it lacked the energy that Blondie was known for uh, with their early fan base. I Once Had a Love, that gradually developed more of a funky melody from a synthesizer groove created by uh, Blondie keyboardist Jimmy Destry. Fact of the matter is uh, that Chris and Debbie, they had a passion for disco. Chris always wanted to do some disco tunes. He loved the energy of disco music. With Destry's funky hook, I Once Had a Love became a dance tune with a disco backbeat. <music> 
Blondie would play I Once Had a Love just to agitate people in the audience who were expecting Blondie to play nothing but, you know, punk. Interestingly enough, it was actually inspired by the number one pop smash, Rock the Boat by the Hughes Corporation. And what a catchy song. Rock the boat, don't rock the boat, baby. Rock the boat, don't tip the boat over. Now, prior to the recording of Parallel Lines, Blondie had toured nonstop for two years. When the band finally got a break from the road, Debbie and Chris, they were effectively homeless. They rented the first place they could find, which was a dingy apartment behind Penn Station. This gave Debbie what she called a horrible, rootless, transient feeling since Penn Station was one of the busiest railway hubs in the world. Blondie felt their record label, Chrysalis, gave them merely token support. But for the recording of Parallel Lines, things were different, very different from the get-go. The band had a large budget to work with. Never had they had that before. And they had a veritable hitmeister in Mike Chapman. He was brought in to produce. Now, Chapman walked into the record plant with a Hollywood swagger. And he wore aviator sunglasses and you know, waved a long white cigarette holder. But he could back up this cocky attitude. I mean, in the 70s, Chapman, like Richard Perry, he seemed to have the Midas touch, as they called it back then. Records that he produced were almost certain to be gold or platinum achievements. He had a lot of hits. So many different artists, too. You know, bands from The Knack to The Sweets, from you know, Pat Benatar to Susie Quattro and Exile. He was all over the musical map. There was a big difference in the work ethic, or maybe the approach in the studio between Mike Chapman and the members of Blondie, though. Chapman, he was a perfectionist. Some people called him a dictator. While Blondie, they were you know, really laid back, often lethargic and unorganized. They just wanted to have fun, and they didn't want to work hard at really anything. Reflecting back on the making of Parallel Lines, the Blondies, you know, as Chapman called them, they were tough in the studio, really tough. They didn't like each other, you know, with the exception of Chris and Debbie, and the tension from the animosity, it was pretty thick. Chapman may have been demanding, but he also understood how to manage unique and immensely talented personalities. I mean, his objective was to get the best out of each and every artist he worked with. He, of course, recognized Debbie's angelic, instantly identifiable voice. He found her challenging, though, in a different way. Uh, Debbie Harry had a tendency to be moody and would break away in tears, isolating herself from the others in a bathroom for hours at a time. Um, Chapman altered his style, his militant style, for this reason. He was more cautious with Debbie Harry. He viewed her as being a highly emotional person. Yeah, his patience, it would pay off. Debbie eventually adhered to his suggestions about her phrasing and timing and attitude in, in her vocal performance. Chapman's fanatical push for perfection and his commanding take after take after take attitude, that didn't go over very well with bassist Nigel Harrison. In fact, Nigel became so frustrated with Chapman's relentless barking actually threw a synthesizer at him uh, during one of the recording sessions. Now, as we find out how the band came together to get this song recorded, I do want to recognize our sponsor, Zenny Eye, with the glasses that I always wear. So here's something you're going to want to take advantage of over this summer. You can turn any pair of Zenny glasses into sunglasses, starting at just $7.95. Just click on the info button right up here, and you can go create your own frames, and you can add the sunglasses. You're going to love it. Again, click the info button or our link below to get the best price and to get your glasses. So you know, ultimately, Mike Chapman, he dedicated hours to just working with each member one-on-one, -on -one, especially Chris Stein. He labored with him much of the time, often re-recording his guitar and Ebo parts. The album, it was close to completion, so Chapman played the material they had up to this point for the you know, obligatory review of the Chrysalis Brass, if you will. It's the age-old story. They were completely unimpressed. <laughs> they told the producer they hired to do what they were paying him for. You know, go get some hits. Chapman asked Debbie and Chris, do you guys have anything else? Was there another song that you're sitting on? So the couple, they played Chapman the demo of I Once Had a Love. You know, the disco song. 
Chapman, he lit up. He advised the band to give the song a, a real disco injection. He felt strongly that adding that element would, it would make all the difference. Debbie and Chris, they took the idea a step further. They incorporated more of a Euro electronic sound, you know, like uh, Kraftwerk or similar to what Georgia Moroder did on uh, Donna Summer's I Feel Love. Which is actually a song that uh, Blondie covered at the Johnny Blitz benefit in May 78 that happened just before. That appearance was arguably the first time in New York City that a rock band performed a disco song during the middle of the rock versus disco divide that was going on. The musical production of Blondie's disco song, that morphed into Heart of Glass. That revolved around a Roland CR-78 drum machine. Now the CR-78, that was introduced in 1978, same year that uh, Parallel Lines was recorded. And the use of the device on Heart of Glass was among the earliest in pop music. It was very unusual and quite unthinkable to use a drum machine in the context of a rock band back then. Debbie explained that Chris Stein and Jimmy Destry, they bought uh, the CR-78 from a music store that was on 47th Street in Manhattan, and they brought it to the studio specifically to use on Heart of Glass. It demonstrated the hybrid foundation of the track, a drum machine that was frequently heard in dance music, combined with an actual drum sound that represented a traditional rock sound. It was amazing. Now to synchronize Clem Burke's actual drum play with the drum machine, uh, the drums were recorded on separate tracks with the bass drum you know, recorded separately from the rest uh, of the drums. Very cool. Uh, Clem's motivation for his drumming it came from the groove of his favorite song at the time. Get this, Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. Yeah, an influence on Blondie. Alive, Chris gave Destry credit for influencing the overall vibe of the song, though. It was Destry who worked the CR-78 in the synthesizer. At that point in history, pairing those two, it was a pioneer move altogether, no question. The process had to be done manually, though, with every note in each beat played in real time rather than looped. Although Heart of Glass was shaped into a dance track, the album version had some rhythmic patterns that were strange, very strange to 70s disco. I mean, 70s disco typically followed a strict uh, four beats per minute pattern for maximum boogie power. Now, the music track of Heart of Glass, on the other hand, has seven beat phrases, with the exception of the last section of the song's reprise, which goes back to eight beats. I mean, the unorthodox beat pattern seemed to be a deliberate punk move by Blondie, you know, to mess up a uh, conventional rhythmic flow with a bump that really completely disrupts the dance groove. Now let's go back to that uh, prickly three-letter word. Radio was pretty much ass-free, if you will, in 78, so a lyrical revision, that was in order. Chris and Debbie agree with Chapman that Debbie couldn't keep singing that word throughout the song, so in an effort to rhyme something with gas, Chris came up with glass. Soon turned out, had a heart of glass. And Debbie changed the lyric to, soon turned out, had a heart of glass, except they left the offending word in one verse, actually. The lyric tweak also led to the song being renamed Heart of Glass. Chris was unaware that Heart of Glass was the title of a German movie directed by Warner Herzog in 76, but you know, there was never a copyright claim against the use of the idiom. For the most part, American radio rolled with the singular ASS, but in the UK, the BBC, they bleeped it out. So during the last scheduled session for the album Parallel Lines at the record plant, the band members were asleep, exhausted on the studio floor, only to be awakened around dawn by Chapman and engineer Peter Coleman leaving for LA to play the final version of this LP for Chrysalis. So get this, even with the addition of the revamped Heart of Glass, the label was still completely unenthusiastic and they pushed for Chapman to go have the band uh, get back in the studio and do it all over again. 
But Chapman, he stuck by the material, and he assured the executive, uh, against his own reputation even, that the album had singles that would definitely be hits. It was hard to believe, but Heart of Glass was actually the fourth single from Parallel Lines. Uh, so picture this was the lead single, and uh, it was a top 15 single in the UK, Sweden, and Ireland, but not here. That was followed by the band's remake of Buddy Holly's I'm Gonna Love You Too, and then Hanging on the Telephone. When three consecutive singles fell to chart, especially in America, you don't get another shot. It's very rare that a record label doesn't just cut their losses and chalk the album up as a stiff altogether. Fortunately, though, they did decide to release a fourth single. Now, initially, whether the single would become a hit or not wasn't the primary concern of the band. When Heart of Glass was dropped as a single, um, you know, the fourth single, the band got lambasted by the rock and roll faithful and by the disco gatekeepers as well. In 1978, Blondie was regarded as one of the forefront groups of New York's burgeoning new wave and punk music scene. They were accused of selling out for releasing a blatant disco song. <music> Debbie recounted that the bands that, that Blondie used to play with on the same bill, they treated them like pariahs. They said that Blondie was pandering to the mainstream, which was something you know, the punk and new wave artists strongly rebelled against, the whole reason the music existed, really. Debbie also confided that their peers were nervous and angry about Blondie bringing different influences into rock music, if you can imagine that. Uh, the peer pressure was so bad, Clem Burke refused to play Heart of Glass you know, when they first added it as part of their main concert set. You know, Clem feeling like he had no choice he relented when the song began to really catch fire. Now, conversely, Chris Stein was unapologetic about Heart of Glass. To Blondie's critics, Stein responded defiantly, as far as I'm concerned, disco is part of R&B, which is a genre I've always loved. While the rock world you know, pelted Blondie on the left, the disco acts blasted the group from the right. It was coming from both sides. Uh, the disco groups accused Blondie of virtually the same offense, pandering to the popular disco scene just to sell a bunch of records. Blondie performed Heart of Glass on a disco-themed TV show, and they were treated as total outcasts. This is what Debbie disclosed. Another group on the show tried to steal their guitars backstage, and the producers of the show wouldn't even give the band their own dressing room. Uh, Blondie couldn't win with the respective tastemakers on either side of the table. However, this is where it gets good. With the radio audience, they scored a huge victory. Heart of Glass was a massive international smash. Suddenly, Blondie transcended from cult status to musical icons. Heart of Glass rocketed to the top of the singles chart in nearly every country on the planet uh, published a chart. UK, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, Switzerland, Austria, West Germany, amongst others. The band received the news about their song topping the Billboard Hot 100 while they were in Milan, Italy. They were doing a TV performance. I guess Mike Chapman surprised Debbie and Chris with a phone call uh, to their hotel room in Milan, and they told him uh, to come downstairs. He says, I'm in the bar. <laughs> Why was Mike Chapman in Italy? This is what they were wondering. So they walked down uh, the stairs to a lush bar lounge and they found Chapman sitting at a table with a bottle of champagne. Congratulations, he declared. You have the number one single in America. You, no like Early in the life of its run as a single, Heart of Glass was played on an episode of the TV sitcom WKRP in Cincinnati. This gave the song critical exposure. The band thanked the producers on the show by giving them a gold record that was prominently placed on the wall in the DJ bullpen scenes from the second season, uh, really to the series finale. There's this guy in town. Hey, how you doing? There's this guy in town. Heart of Glass has been covered so many times from the Toadies to postmodern jukebox, but uh, really a lot of people, uh, a lot of females have uh, celebrated the song as... Uh, you know, Debbie Harry being a trailblazer and a highly influential cultural icon. Miley Cyrus has done it. 
Haley Williams at Paramore has added to the set. Erasure has done it as well. They did a wonderful cover of it. Heart of Glass has also been placing countless films, way too many to mention here, but some of the most notable are scenes in Donnie Brasco in 1997. I don't even want to look at you. The Iceman in 2012. Training Day in 2017, and recently in the crime drama House of Gucci, that came out in 2021. Heart of Glass, the song that was created as a novelty and added to Blondie's third studio album for diversity, progressed into a controversial global sensation and it played a major part in a critical juncture of rock history, breaking genre barriers and ushering in new sounds. It also gave Blondie a whole new reputation. It's a band that had the vision and the courage to experiment with different musical styles. I remember hearing this as a little kid. It was one of the first, probably, it's probably one of the first 20 songs I heard as a kid that I remember, you know, playing on a radio as my introduction to music altogether. It's just one of those songs that you can't put a label on. I mean, even though people call it a disco song, it's it's just part of of so many different types of genres, which is what makes it so incredible. With the recording of Heart of Glass, Debbie Harry, Chris Stein, and Blondie arguably initiated a whole new musical genre, the genre of dance rock. And it was, and still is, a gas. Hey, thanks so much for watching. I love this story. Get, leave us a comment about this disco smash. I don't even know if you can call it disco, dance rock, whatever it is. I love that they, they replaced the swear word. Let me know your first memories of this song. What do you think about Blondie as a band, as a cultural force? Let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Make sure to check us out on Patreon. Check out our merch below. It's all about keeping the music alive. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.